Hello and welcome to the Retro Hour podcast, episode number 42, your weekly dose of retro gaming and technology news with me, Dan Wood. And me, Ravi Abbott. Having a welcome break from uh, Mac Hell today, Ravi. Oh God, it's been awful. I'm, I'm trying to get my G5 going and these dual layer DVDs <laughs> and everything and different formats of USB sticks. I've been uh, in a Mac nightmare. You can take a little breather now for the next half an hour. Relief. <laughs> so uh, if you haven't checked out the show before, maybe you're a new listener to the Retro Hour. We have them coming in all the time. The way the show works is every Every single Friday we come out, we run through the big stories that have been making it in the headlines of the world of retro and tech throughout the week. And then, for the second half an hour of the show, we hand over to a very special guest. Oh God, and the guest we have this week is just one for you 8-bit fans, but also you 16-bit fans as well. Well, this is Rob Hewson. He is the CEO of the recently reformed Hewson Consultants and the son of Andrew Hewson, who set the company up back in the day, you know, the Commodore 64 and Spectrum days. And then after that, 21st Century Entertainment, Pinball Dreams, Massive Fantasies. Massive Britsoft company. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And even, you know, going back to the 8-bit days, Uridium, Cybernoid, all those classic games. And all those pinball games. How cool were those? Obviously, he was there, you know, his dad running the company. He was a kid that grew up in this era. He yeah. must have been the coolest kid in school. Totally. And, uh, you know, we mentioned him last week at Play Expo where yeah. he bumped into him. So now he's on the show. It's well, great. Yeah. Houston are back and uh, they've got a new game coming out, which will definitely appeal to retro heads. So we're going to talk more about that. And we'll chat to Rob Houston on the Retro Hour in around 20 minutes from now. Now, obviously, we do thank our donators on the show every week as well. We've had some very generous ones this week. Yeah, there's a little button on the front page. You can just donate there. And this week, it's Christopher Folds. And Christopher Ellis. Oh, thank you so much, guys. And also, we've got a little announcement. Now, I'm afraid we're going to go to Geek Out Scotland for uh, Halloween, but that's been postponed, so sorry, that's going to have to be next year. But we are going to be at Game City in Nottingham, which is in our hometown, the big games event, and that's going to be on the 27th of this month. So it's coming up next Thursday. Next Thursday, yeah. And I'm going to be DJing there <laughs> live. Now, you may have seen Ravi on Facebook. You know, your, your streams, dude. I think it's fair to say, gone viral. Yeah, yeah, 17K or something. It's mad. So if you want to come and see Ravi live on the decks without a single mistake... Oh, God, no, don't. <laughs> <laughs> then he will be DJing at a Game City, uh, which happens in Nottingham. It's on for a few days, isn't it? Yeah, so they have a different kind of theme every day, and we're doing 80s Day, which okay. is going to be, you know, all the old school machines. I think people will be able to bring their machines in as well, talk about them, possibly, you know, look at some stuff you've never seen before. Mm -hmm. And that will be at the National Video Game Arcade in the city centre. So that's going to be in Hockley, and it's this massive building dedicated to gaming so pop along if you can well you're going to be down there all day thursday i'm going to be popping along in the afternoon so yeah. uh, absolutely if anywhere near nottingham you want to come down and uh, hang out and listen to a few amiga mods with uh dj yeah, I, might, Ravi. I might try and uh, stream it on the facebook as well oh nice yeah. okay so look out for that on facebook and if you want to come down to game city we'll pop the links to that in the show notes at the retrohour.com now this week's stories we're going to start with um <laughs> a rather obscure game that never came out for the snes Okay, why? Have you heard of Socks the Cat? Socks the Cat? No, I've never heard of Socks the Cat. Well, Socks the Cat was a real-life character. He was Bill Clinton's cat. Okay. <laughs> Lived in the White House uh, during the 90s, and they were actually going to make a game for the snares of Socks the Cat. So they're going to make him like, you know, like Bubsy or someone like that. He was going to be his own video game character. This is weird, because I'm looking at the front cover here, and it's like, you know, you're Democrats... It's always the donkey, mm. and the elephant's always the Republican. <laughs> so, like, what socks the cat? He's like a, a... Run, running out of the White House, by the way, <laughs> isn't he? So, uh, this game, it was you know quite far into development, but then it's kind of become an infamous title on the SNES because there were a few copies of this released to magazines for review, and then the uh, the publisher behind it, um, Kaneko, they were called, ran out of money. A prototype of the game was out there in a few different places, but the game never got released. So um, they've actually... What a weird concept, mate. <laughs> this is strange. Yeah. It looks like he's got attitude, and he looks like he looks quite annoying, actually, doesn't he? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but this is one of those games, and it kind of, you know, it's gone down in um, video game folklore. And finally, people are going to get a chance to play this game. Now, they're going to be releasing this in July 2017. There's a Kickstarter running at the moment. They're hoping to raise $30,000 to get this game out there. And they're promising it's going to be out on like a proper Super Nintendo cartridge in the box. It's going to be like, you know, an official game 25 years after it should have come out. Oh, cool. Cartridge and everything. Cartridge, oh. printed label, manual in the box. So it will look like essentially what this game would have looked like if it had come out when it should have back in 1993. Wow. A couple of years late, but that's pretty good. <laughs> 
Do you think they'll be doing other titles later, like maybe Downing Street's Larry the Cat? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's uh, quite a concept, isn't it? Yeah, it's very strange having a, a, a political pet <laughs> as your main uh, character. In terms of just having a new Super Nintendo game, you know. Yeah, yeah, um, it could be really good, actually. A hidden secret. But um, talking of Nintendo as well, we've had a little sneak peek on the Engadget in their offices. Okay. Have you seen this at all? There's so many of these doing the rounds at the moment, but this is a new look, is it, then, at Nintendo's offices, or is it an old one? No, it's a new look. They've posted some photos, and it's of a storage room in the Kyoto headquarters, and it's full of those disk systems. (sighs) This is like an Aladdin's cave, isn't it? Yeah, because these are like the rarest things, Um, the Famicom disk system, because everyone wanted them so they could play pirate games on their their snares or on their Famicom. And... uh, They've got even the disc cards, and these are in perfect condition. You know, they must have an archive of all of these, like, really rare ones. And, you know, some companies, they just chucked out their old stock. They got rid of it, but it looks like Nintendo have actually kept everything in good condition, which is good to see. It's mad, though, yeah, because on this picture on Engadget, the top one is, it is Famicom Disk Systems, brand new in a box, and there's a shelf here, and I know we can see five of them on a shelf. Looks like there's another shelf above this as well, and below it too. So what are these things just sat there for like 30 years in this room? I guess so, you know. And they said the format was a, a piracy paradise. It didn't end up kind of, you know, fully releasing it. But this is great. It's awesome. I mean, they've actually, Nintendo posted these um, on, on their website. Um, it's all in Japanese. You've got to kind of translate it. But I think it's so interesting to see what lies in the vaults of these companies. Yeah. And you've got to wonder, like, you know, does Sega have stuff in there? Like, you know, is it's like Sega Neptunes, you know, the unreleased console they never brought out? Is there stuff like that in their warehouse, maybe? Well, well, there's a video here of them actually using the disc card system. And it's a modern shot video. Uh, so they've obviously got one out and played with it, and it all works. <laughs> Which is amazing. You know, Nintendo fanboys are looking at this like, you know, crying. Let me in that room. <laughs> yeah, like, <laughs> waiting for those to appear on eBay. I think it's so cool. You know, but I think, you know, for, for companies like Nintendo, who now, you know, obviously with this mini NES coming out and everything, they kind of really are respecting their heritage, and they're kind of, you know, realising that people are actually interested in this kind of stuff. So, yeah, and I guess because they're one of the oldest ones, they've managed to keep all of this stuff. Do, do you think Microsoft would have kept a lot of its old stuff? Or? Uh, old copies of Windows 2.0. Yeah. <laughs> no one wants to see that stuff. Though, no, no, no. <laughs> Millennium edition. Yeah, copy of Encarta from 1994. Yeah. <laughs> but um, hopefully we'll see more of Nintendo's vaults. It'd be hot. Just imagine having a tour of that place. Oh, God. <laughs> uh, my, I'd come out, my coat would be just full of... <laughs> <laughs> Where did all those disk systems go? Yeah. Get rid <laughs> so, of him. We'll link him to this video in the show now at the retro hour.com. Uh, another game, it seems to be a bit of a week for uh, games that were made back in the day that never got a release. And um, this is another weird one. Forget Socks the Cat. What about this? Charlie Chaplin on the Commodore 64. <laughs> That's, it just sounds great. <laughs> I, I want to play it already. Really bizarre. This game was made back in the 80s. It actually did come out on a couple of platforms, including the uh, Amstrad CPC. And if you look at it, I mean, they're really clever with this because I imagine it took up you know, quite low resources on the system because to kind of be a homage to the Charlie Chaplin movies, the whole game's in black and white. Yeah, and (laughs) and they've also got, like, little, uh, you know, speech in it, like speech on the screen like they had in silent movies. Which is awesome. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. They're about to release this game. They ran into financial problems, as is, you know, often the story with these kind of uh, projects. Um, One of the developers didn't get paid properly, so they kind of shelved the project. And now it turns out, you know, all this time later, they've actually found kind of an incomplete version of it for the Commodore 64. And you can download it and play it. It's from 1987 as well, isn't it? Yeah. So and uh, it looks like you're kind of with Charlie Chaplin and you're making scenes. So it's like a little kind of filmmaker, you know? But you've got like camera lights and all that kind of thing there and above him and things. So. Yeah, that's crazy. It looks. Pretty, it kind of reminds me a bit looking at it, a bit like Leisure Suit Larry and other Sierra kind of games. Yeah, yeah. The art style of it. Yeah, so. definitely. US um, Gold, very nice. Yeah, it was meant to be out on US Gold. So there is actually a download link if you want to try it. It's obviously an incomplete beta and it is quite crashy and buggy apparently, but... That's something I never knew existed. Yeah, that's amazing. Well, we've got another thing here, which is teletext. And this is teletext being repurposed for art. And I've found this absolutely amazing. Um, If you know about teletext, it was this old kind of system we had on television back in the days to get sports scores. (laughs) All done on BBC Micros, wasn't it, the graphics? Mode 7 graphics. Yeah, yeah, really old. uh, 80 by 80 pixels, I think that was the kind of size. Well, there's a modern-day artist 
who started using teletext as his medium to create art. And the crazy thing is, a German television station has actually said, OK, this is quite cool, ARD. Um, we're going to make you our artist in residence. So he's got a 30-day residency creating teletext art for them. <laughs> so every day, this, I think he does four or five pieces and it actually gets broadcast out on the ARD network. So do they do this, just broadcast this then? You're watching it? Yeah, so they're, re digital, right? they're rebroadcasting Teletext, wow. this German company. Are. So they've basically uh, bought it back, you know, just their, for this artist. I love their tagline, live from the 1980s. <laughs> yeah, live from the 1980s. And let me just find this artist's name because it would be really bad for me to... Dan Farrimond, that's the one. And he's basically saying he's been living in this teletext land for 30 days and, you know, he's made 50 pieces of art for them. And at the end of September, they'll all be available in a teletext exhibition. Right, nice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I love the art style of teletext, though. It's really nostalgic looking at it, isn't it? Oh, yeah, it's amazing. It's like, uh, God, these really early Nokia kind of images you had or I don't know it's actually unique I don't think there's anything else like teletext well maybe. I remember you know using the BBC micro at school and kind of recognise the fonts and that kind of thing so I think that's what you know is Oracle the BBC service of teletext wasn't it and I know they ran theirs on BBC micros because obviously you know Acorn made those machines for a BBC project so I think the kind of art style I think it was mode 7 it was called the teletext mode on the BBC micro okay. and obviously we did have you know one of our early shows we had Mr Biffo on didn't we, we did a digitizer yeah yeah which was a teletext based games mag yeah and that was crazy god that when did that start like 89 90 it was very early on wasn't it yeah and i remember stuff like um bamboozle on teletext you know where you get like um puzzles you'd have to press reveal to get the answer for them and that kind of thing and that flashing text that you get well well this this artist as well he says he didn't get involved with teletext till 2012 right okay so he started creating a, a series of pages at the inaugural Teletext Festival. There's a Teletext Festival? There's a Teletext Dude. Art Festival. Why aren't we there? <laughs> yeah. That's it. Let's see where this is. You know, I wonder, though, how do you make Teletext art in this day and age? There must be some kind of emulator or something you can download. Yeah, there must be some strange thing. I don't know. Maybe at the Teletext Festival you'll get to find out. Dude, we are there. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, if you love the look of Teletext as well, this is definitely worth checking out. And you can tell this guy's put a lot of hard work into this. I mean, it, it's, it's some of the most visually impressive Teletext artwork I've seen, all in about 16 colours as well. Yeah, and he's got stuff for, like, you know, the Star Wars, uh, Star Trek 50th yeah. anniversary and everything. It's amazing. Yeah, so if you miss Teletext, definitely worth a look. Now, this is one for you, Ravi. I know you've been going on about it still. Slum dreams, are you? Lara Croft. Oh, God, Lara. <laughs> <laughs> Ravi did meet Lara Croft, uh, the original. What was her name? Natalie Cook? Um, yeah, yeah, that was it. And uh, she was just before Katie Price actually became Lara Croft for a while. Which one did you prefer? Uh, Natalie Cook. <laughs> <laughs> you never met Katie Price, have you? No, no. We had John Kershaw on, who had him sitting on, uh, had her sitting on his knee. <laughs> So after that, um, I saw this really cool post uh, this week on uh, the official PlayStation UK page, actually. You know, Square Enix, obviously, behind the um, 20th anniversary celebrations of Tomb Raider, uh, Rise of the Tomb Raider. Yeah. They've actually made a box that resembles the original um, PS1 games. So what they've done is they've put the new artwork into a PS1 box, essentially. So this is just like a mock-up. Unfortunately, they haven't released any more details apart from putting this up on there, but from what I've read... They've just done it, you know, for a photo shoot. I don't yeah. think they're going to be releasing it like this. It's still kind of cool, you know. They've got the old stuff in the styley, and I guess it was probably pretty easy for them to do that. <laughs> and uh, good marketing, you know. Yeah, well, it looks cool. They've got it, you know. This picture, it's so nostalgic looking at it. Um, they've got the original, you know, fat PS1 there as well. And they've put it in the small, you know, CD size box with the manual and the inlays all printed as well. Someone does make a good comment in the Facebook post, though, that it's not really all that realistic because if you're looking at the disc in the box, um, all of those little spokes around the edge, they're all in there. That never happened on the PS1 games. It all fell out, hadn't they, after about two days? <laughs> <laughs> it's true, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you know, for me this week, um, obviously we had a PlayStation special last week, didn't we? Yeah. For the Bedroom Stabilians movie that's coming out. I actually dug my PS1 out on Saturday. Ooh. What Felt happened? Right. My girlfriend was out Saturday night, so I thought, oh, well, you know, let's do a bit of old-school PlayStation gaming. Got it set up, hooked it up to the screen, poured myself a glass of Coke, so I'm doing, you know, uh, sober October. Oh, God, how's that going? Fine, no problems with that. Yeah, you know, counting down the days. Although, I did feel like drinking after what happened. 
Started to play Tomb Raider 2, suddenly it crashed, and I was going on here. Restarted it. Lasers died in my PS1. Oh, no, man. Well, you've got to have mine. I know. That's yeah. it. I, I got it two pounds from the cattle market, <laughs> so go ahead, rip it to bits. You've got one of the slimmer ones, haven't you? The PS1. One, yeah, the yeah, later one. Yeah. Apparently, you can transplant the laser into the older ones, so oh, nice, my PS1 nice. may live again. Yeah. So. You've got a PS2 as well. I have, yes, but there's something about the original. So, you know, we're in. Um, where did I get this from the other week? I actually bought a original. I was in Derby, actually, at that um, retro store there. I got, you know, one of the um, pre. Uh, dual shot controllers, you know, oh, yeah, yeah. just the uh, D-pad on it. Yeah, I got one of those, and I thought I'm going to play Tomb Raider like I remember playing it before we had the analog sticks and all that. So, the PS2 is great for playing PS1 games, but it's something about having that original box in front. Yeah, and some games don't even support the analogs, do they? Some of the older yeah. ones. Well, I've been a... trying to look at the early PlayStation catalog as well. I've been kind of exploring that a bit. Yeah, play Pandemonium. That's wicked. 3D Lemmings. I played for a bit before the laser. Oh went. God, mate. <laughs> yeah, that well wasn't great, if I'm yeah. honest. <laughs> Wipeout Camera was playing angles. as well. I yeah. forgot how hard Wipeout is. Wipeout's really solid. You've got to get that air braking really, really good on the corners because it's just like, yeah, bam, straight into the wall. Then you stop, don't you? Yeah, <laughs> it's like you stop it. dead. The later games are so much easier compared to that. But yeah, I've been on a bit of a nostalgic PS1 uh, trip after last week, so that oh, was nice. good timing, yeah. them releasing that. Now, before we get into this week's interview with Rob Hewson, I imagine, you know, lots of people might be listening to this week's show who remember Hewson Consultants games back on the Spectrum. And uh, it finally came out yesterday then. Oh, yeah, the... Uh... Spectrum Vega Plus, because there's so many out there at the moment. <laughs> We've got to let you know which one it is. And this one is the handheld LCD screen one. This one, I think, looks... Um, you know, like you said, there are lots of new Spectrums out at the moment. This one looks very different, though, because it's a handheld. Yeah, and uh, it's coming with a 1,000 games already pre-installed. That's nuts, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. That must be like pretty much the majority of the catalogue. Yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah, games yeah. I'm sure least, there'll anyway. be some Houston stuff in there as well. <laughs> Absolutely. It's got a colour LCD screen as well. Um, and it looks like, I love the styling of it as well. If Sinclair did make a handheld back in the 80s, it would have probably looked like that. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I, I suspect this isn't going to take that much battery power. It'll yes. probably <laughs> <laughs> last, quite, uh, last quite a long time. And it also features a switchable Kempston or cursor key joystick emulation so oh, nice. I know you'd like that Dan whatever your uh, preferred input method is you can do it on this little device you do make a good point there about battery life though um, I was watching what was I watching the other day it was um, an episode of Bad Influence from 92 and they were testing out the Game Gear yeah. the Lynx and they did have you seen the episode where they do a battery test to see how no, long it lasts no no I haven't at all and no. they worked out that to play a Sega Game Gear that was the most expensive one it will cost you four pounds an hour to play it. Wow! Cost of the right. I, I remember all of my friends that used to have Game Gears. They would be attached to the wall when they yeah. were playing them. <laughs> you know, I'd never see anyone out in the wild playing a Game Gear. I saw a Lynx actually a couple of times out in the wild, mm. but Game Gear they'd be like stuck in the corner of a room <laughs> next to the socket trying to move away. Kind of know? defeating the point of a handheld in the first yeah, place. Yeah, totally. <laughs> so battery life is one thing that's definitely come on a fair bit in the last twenty years. So uh, I imagine this will, uh, you know, be. Um, it can't use all that much processing power as well. Having a little uh, FPGA spectrum in there too. Yeah, and they're saying the early limited edition versions would be red, white, and blue as well. But they're no longer available because they've already been sold. <laughs> An Indiegogo. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, it was due for a launch on October 20th. So at the time of uh, the show comes out, it should already be out by now. If you've got one, drop us a tweet or a Facebook message. Let us know what you think. Yeah, yeah. Tell us or post a little review on Facebook or YouTube or something. Because we saw the um, spectrum next, didn't we, at Play? Yeah, yeah, that was that was really nice, but it was kind of in a beta stage. It didn't have all the slick, sexy keyboard and stuff that they've shown in the photos. It's yeah. just like from Jim Bagley's bag, <laughs> like, uh, you know. Yeah, and he, a PS2 keyboard on it and stuff, didn't he? But yeah. I wasn't a big Spectrum fan back in the day. I was more of a Commodore boy, as you know. There's no secret to any listener um, to this show. But um, when I saw Jim demoing that, and there's all these new Spectrum stuff coming out, I'm kind of thinking now I should get into the Spectrum scene a bit more. So I'm going to get one of these. I just haven't decided which one yet. I just feel completely lost within the operating system and stuff. I wouldn't know anything about it, but then I suppose that would be fun. Yeah. Learning a, a new old school, completely pointless <laughs> operating system, you know? It'd be good. Well, Great. I should buy one of them. You should buy another one and then we'll compare them. Yeah, yeah. We yeah. could have a, a spectrum battle. <laughs> I, I hope you get the crap one. <laughs> Sorry. Spe- there is no crap spectrums, Ravi. Oh, Everyone well, knows well that. these new ones, we'll see. <laughs> That's it. So, After the reviews. <laughs> yeah, do send us your reviews. We'd love to find out. So thank you for checking out episode number 42 of The Retro Hour. The show will be out again next Friday. Available from our website, theretrohour.com, iTunes, YouTube, Stitcher, all your favourite places. And of course, do remember, we have got a little uh, donation button on the website. If you ever want to pop something in the tip jar, it all goes into the running of the show. You can find that at theretrohour.com. If you're coming down to Game City, We'll see you down there Thursday. 
Yeah, yeah. And I'll, I'll drop you some tunes or do a rewind or something. <laughs> <laughs> you do rewinds on your uh, Amiga 1200. Yeah, you press backwards. It goes... I bet it sounds exactly like that as well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right then, let's get on to this week's special guest for the next 45 minutes or so. This is definitely one for uh, anyone that's into gaming in the 80s and 90s. Such an interesting interview this week. Rob Hewson from Hewson Consultants on the Retro Hour. And we'll see you next Friday. Ciao. You're listening to the Retro Hour podcast, and let's welcome this week's special guest, Rob Hewson. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Obviously, Hewson Consultants, legendary company um, back in the day, who are back for the 21st century. We actually met at the uh, Play Expo in Manchester the other week where you were demoing uh, your latest game, which we'll definitely talk more about in a moment. But let's go right back to the beginning. Growing up, you must have been surrounded by games and computers. What's kind of your earliest memory? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It, it was uh, it was pretty uh, it was pretty awesome. I remember having the Commodore sixty four. Um, Dad decided to bring back the C sixty four for for me and my sister to to play on, rather than a Specky for whatever reason. Um, so I remember playing um, all the Houston uh, classics back then. I was born in eighty one, so I remember playing Gribbley's Day Out, which came in, came out in nineteen eighty five. I remember Iridium, uh, Paradroid, Nebulous. Um, and uh, one, a couple of defining memories. Um, I remember learning how to spell my surname from the title screen uh, on Iridium. <laughs> uh, that's cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and running outside into the summer to show off to my friends that I knew how to spell it now. Um, that, I don't know, that, that just stuck in my mind for some reason. Uh, I remember going along to the warehouse at, at Dad's uh, work, and um, me and my sister used to sort of clamber around through the shelves and on top of boxes, digging out cassettes and inlays and posters to take home. Um, and uh, yeah, we got to go along to some of the uh, the exhibitions and hand out posters and things as well. So yeah, it was, it was pretty good. What's the background on the name Houston Consultants? Because I know it didn't originally start as a games company, did it? It always sounded a bit more like, you know, some kind of official body or like an accountant's firm or something when or you read the name. Or architects or something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So this is all in, um, a, a lot of this is covered in Dad's book that he wrote recently. Um, but um, basically he was a government scientist. Um, he worked at the British Museum and he worked at the Institute of Hydrology and he did some stuff with computers and then um, in the late 70s, you know, he had a young family. My sister had been born by then. He didn't have much money, so uh, he needed to make some more money on the side. So he did some work tutoring kids in maths because he was very good at maths. He had a master's in probability and statistics. Mm -hmm. And he also did some consultancy on the side for people. So I think he he did some some kind of consultancy about lava flows because he was doing flood statistics, so um, his statistics would work with that. So I guess he called it Houston Consultants because of doing this sort of freelance consultancy work. And then um, he, uh, he, he bought a ZX80 with a £500 loan from the bank and a typewriter, an old second-hand typewriter and, uh, and a desk at an auction or something like that. And... Um, wrote that wrote uh, this book called hints and tips for the zx80 which is the first sort of product that Houston consultants uh, produced and he just kept the badge the same having done the consultancy work uh, earlier well he must have had a bit of a passion for writing and uh, where did this spur from well actually he as a government scientist you have to produce um, reports you have to produce scientific um, you know you have to be able to record your results and broadcast them to your your peers for review and, and, and all the rest of it and I think he said that he'd discovered that he couldn't write very well um, you know he, he he couldn't get his his thoughts down on paper in a coherent manner and it had taken him a year to write this scientific paper that he needed to write and um, typical uh, typical of my dad um, he found this to be unacceptable and so his decision to sit down and write a book was because he couldn't write very well. He needed to address that problem. Right. So writing a book was his way of saying, right, I'm going to learn how to write properly. And um, of course he did. And now he's, he's, a, he's a very good writer. 
dropped himself in the deep end there then, didn't he? <laughs> he did. He did. But obviously that book, the ZX80 uh, Hints and Tips book, they were like legendary in the Sinclair scene. I mean, it must have been quite a defining moment then when the that, that book was successful. Yeah, this book was, uh, he typed it up. Uh, my mum, who was pregnant with me at the time, you know, helped him type it up on the typewriter. They, they It was literally photocopied and stapled together. And then he took out these tiny, tiny ads in personal computer world magazine or whatever and his fondest memory or one of his fondest memories is coming down uh, the stairs in the morning and seeing all these envelopes landing on the doormat with checks and postal orders inside them if you remember those <laughs> uh from people wanting to buy the book so um yeah i think that was um that was a pretty special moment for him you must have had all the kids in school asking for like cheats tips and the latest game <laughs> from you yes yeah i think uh well, we did when I was a bit older. Um, we did. I did arrange a sale of uh, Houston Games because uh, you know Dad had there was stock in the warehouse, and so I convinced my dad, and we went we went around the village, and I was put up all these posters that I'd drawn little designs on, uh, and got all my friends to come round one weekend, and uh, um, <laughs> and and they all came into the back room in the house and bought some of the leftover stock. And then I remember sort of, you know, we made 150 pounds or 200 pounds or something from a bunch of school kids coming around. And I went to my dad and I was like, oh, I don't know what I'm going to do. How am I going to spend 150 pounds? And he said, well, you don't get to keep the whole 150 pounds. And, and I was like, what, what do you mean? And he's like, well, you know, you have to split that up. You've got your costs. You've got your. So I think that was my first business lesson. <laughs> my first business lesson. Yeah, brought back down to earth. <laughs> brought back down to earth, exactly. Well, how did the uh, move go from the um, the hints and tips books to actually, you know, publishing games and making games? So uh, he did a couple of he did the first two books, um, and obviously uh, the, the second one was the ZX eighty one book. And then he got a phone call out of the blue from someone in London saying they're setting up a magazine called Sinclair User. And seeing, seeing as he's written these books, would he like to write a regular column in the magazine? Uh, which, and of course, he said, uh, yeah, great, sure, fantastic. And somebody came around and took his photograph. And then he had his um, Houston Helpline column in Sinclair User Magazine. And obviously, it's Houston Helpline column. It's Houston Consultants selling his books and a couple of games that he'd written himself and a couple of programs that he'd written himself on cassette and so people started to send in cassettes to him saying oh i've made this game um perhaps you know you can help us get it to market and so he you know you know could you publish this for it for us and he thought oh right okay i didn't realize i was a games publisher but seeing as you were all sending me these games i guess i am um and just started uh, you know started picking through the best ones and and off he went well um when people were sending you the games, were you playing any of them at all? Were you like oh, quality well, control? Or? No, I mean this would have been this would have been when I was sort of two years old or something like that. So uh, no, I don't think so. But um, Dad's brother had joined him, uh, eighty two, eighty three. I think Dad was um, he he wasn't he didn't go full full time on Houston until maybe eighty three or eighty two. So he he did it for about two or three years uh, on the side. And he was still working at the Institute of Hydrology. So he used to um, get home from work, go up into this, this sort of spare bedroom that was going to became my bedroom. Um, and he'd work until four in the morning on Hughes and Consultants. Then he'd get up at 8 a.m. and go off to his day job. Um, and that went on for about two or three years. So uh, I had no idea how he, how he had the stamina for it. But he went full time, um, 82, 83, I think, and then... His brother joined, and he had, you know, a few other staff, and 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 uh, that, uh, I think they sort of reviewed the games that came in, uh, and perhaps that's uh, one of the things he notes is that what perhaps part of the reason that Houston got a reputation for quality mm -hmm. is because they had tons of cassettes coming in, and they just didn't have time to consider anything but the very best of them, so they only published the best because they didn't have the capacity to do anything else, um, and of course why would you publish anything except for the, the best ones that come in? It sounds like, you know, it's, it was always very much a family business. How early on did you get involved then? Houston closed down in 1991. Certainly, I, uh, you know, like I said, I got to go along to some of the exhibitions and hand out posters. And, um, and I would, 
design games on the living room floor on I say design games I mean get bits of A4 paper sellotape them together and draw you know pretend levels on them and my dad would humor me that they, that they'd uh, you know that they would release the game and then have to let me down gently some weeks <laughs> later when he realized I hadn't given up on it yet I did have when he started 21st century entertainment which is obviously in the 90s I did have a a summer job there when I was 15 or 16 um you know opening the mail making people cups of coffee um and I was then at that point um able to uh, get some experience of reviewing some of the games that developers have been sent in and writing up reports on them um I don't know how seriously they took the reports but they they let me do that so uh yeah it was good well you mentioned a bit of your kind of homemade develop there development on paper um <laughs> Starting from kind of scratch, there must have been some kind of in-house development tools that Houston had to make themselves, or were there, was there well, anything to make not, it faster? Uh, and well, what I do know is that people were obviously developing things from scratch. I mean, the Graph Gold guys, you know, Steve Turner, he could write in assembler, um, and you know, and and do things in machine code. But so you really had to with those old machines, you really had to get down to the metal Um, because the capacity was very limited there's no such thing as uh, you know kind of middleware game engines certainly developers wrote their own tools of course um, their own um, you know loading systems or their own graphics um, packages and would refine them for different releases and Houston did have an in-house team so I'm sure they had some some tools of their own you know Dominic Robinson was one of the the main guys on the in-house team when he wrote Zynapps and did the Iridium spectrum conversion Programmers back then, they had to really, really know their stuff. You know, uh, they had to really get down to low level coding um, and do things in um, such uh, incredible detail that a lot of developers these days would just wouldn't know where to begin, I think, which is why people have so much uh, admiration and respect for the those those um, developers. Every single little bite of memory was important, wasn't it? Absolutely. And, and every trick in the book, you know, you had to you had to trick the hardware um you know switch off the the interrupts uh the so that the that had been designed you know into the processor you had to switch them off to to get your graphics updates to be fast enough which again is something dad talks about in his in his new book and and that kind of stuff is just it doesn't even come into consideration these days because there's so much processing power and you've got you know unity or unreal in between you and the machine anyway so um yeah, like you say, it was every every bite. You mentioned Iridium there, actually. I was going to say, I mean, you know, we talked about the quality of um, Houston games. And that kind of, it was, you know, essentially parallax scrolling on a Commodore 64, which was a very impressive trick for the time. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And um, obviously, there's a few things that I think Andrew Braybrook was doing there. One of them was that he was only scrolling the, the sort of central portion of the screen where the um, dreadnought was in the background. So the top and bottom although it looked like it was moving, they weren't actually scrolling. Um, so there was saved some some time there to, to, to make it run faster. But yeah, that was a 60 frames per second game in the US, you know, on the NTSC version in 1986. That's crazy. And it, uh, no wonder it is so popular because it, it just played uh, so smoothly. And... Like an arcade yeah. game. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Exactly, absolutely. I think the demo, they, they actually agreed and there was... Uh, there was a bit of um, kind of back and forth. Dad, Dad asked um, Andrew Braybrook and, and and Steve Turner to produce a one-level demo because obviously he 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 knew that if if he had a demo of this, it was just going to blow people away, and the press coverage they they would get would be incredible. But of course, asking a developer to do a demo, especially in those days, is like saying that their response is, "Well, you can either we can either work on the game or we can work on the demo." Because a game is, it's not like a book or a movie where you can take some pages or you can take a scene, polish them up and, and that's it. You have to get the entirety of the systems working to get one level in the same way as you do for 15 levels. Because, you know, it's, it's the code has to run everything. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah, it's, absolutely. It's, it's an entire system that has to be finished to get one level. And, and, and um, you can't just film a bit and then I'll do the rest later, or write a bit, and I'll do the rest later. So um, they did the demo, and he had that demo, and he took it round to the magazines, and 
see uh, computer and video games magazine you know he went to see um the editor was it tim metcalf i think who didn't live too far away and he played the demo and said right great and and then dad pulled out that artwork that beautiful box artwork that steve weston had uh, done and uh, tim metcalf said pretty much there and then great can i put the box artwork on the cover of cmvg and uh, dad sort of went yeah i think i think i can handle that <laughs> you know so it's uh, uh, I'm, I'm remembering I'm remembering all of this from from the book from, because uh, obviously I helped dad edit the book. So um, these are his stories, really, uh, that I'm retelling here. So it's amazing how much you remember when you've been working <laughs> through it like that. But again, one of those one of those stories. Aren't I doing a great job of plugging this book, by the way? <laughs> yeah, I just keep sneaking it in there, don't I? Um, one of the stories from Hints and Tips for Video Game Pioneers is that, uh, you know, that cover went on the cover of CMVG. But um, they got in a little bit of hot water for it because other people who'd um, other publishers who'd advertised in that issue or had games reviewed in that issue were not too happy that basically the cover of the magazine was the cover of Iridium. Like a a front page Uh, advert, essentially. Yeah, exactly. Um, And as far as this is one of dad's, you know, little claims, as far as he's aware, no magazine since has had the box art reproduced exactly in its entirety uh, on the front cover in quite the same way because of because of that little episode. So uh, there we go. One thing I was wondering as well, if your school was anything like mine, um, you know, all the kids at my school used to pass around uh, copied discs and cassette tapes and all that kind of thing. That must Did that happen at your school? And was there much kind of, you know, with your dad being so high profile in the industry, was that something you had to kind of stay out of or was it a bit of an awkward moment for you? I, yeah, I mean, I, to be honest with you, um, I don't remember much of that happening in, in primary school. And I went to quite a small school in a because in a, I grew up in a little village uh, in Oxfordshire and it was a very small school. So I, I, I don't honestly have much recollection of that. By the time I, I was in secondary school, it was all Mega Drive and SNES and, and what have you. So, uh, no, I don't remember that. But um, Dad certainly um, talks, about, talks about how he still finds it a little bit awkward on occasion today when people come up to him and go oh great oh yeah i used to i used to i, I remember your games i used to copy them in the playground and he thinks why are you telling me this you know that was one of the reasons that we had to close the company is because piracy was so um so right so it's a kind of a double-edged sword i think for him uh me i i think it passed me by to be honest at the time well uh you said earlier that you had that high reputation for games uh high quality games did you feel that, uh, or did your father feel that he had to live up to that reputation and kind of keep producing really high quality games? Uh, no, I don't think he wasn't really aware of it at the time. He was just uh, doing to him what was obvious, which is why would you put out anything that you didn't think was good? You know, what what would be the point from a business perspective? He's only found out recently from doing the book that people have been saying to him on the Kickstarter and through the community and what have you, yeah, you ha- you guys had a reputation for quality. And he's only sort of, you know, he didn't really know that. And and then he, he, so he kind of wrestles with that in the book and says, well, why would that be? How How is that the case? Because um, it can't be, he, he kind of doesn't think it can be anything they were doing that was special, other than the fact that they were very choosy. But why would you not be choosy is what he sort of wrestles with. And he concludes that maybe it's because it was a small company that other people perhaps had the capacity to put out more games and so were tempted to be less choosy. Um, And then, you know, and there were some people who just thought it perhaps it was a get rich quick thing and and the bubble might burst or. But um, no, I mean, their natural instinct was well, we'll select the best games and we'll put those out and um, and the rest of them, which is frankly was the majority that they're receiving, would unfortunately not get published through Houston. They, maybe they got published somewhere else. But no, he was quite surprised and taken aback by this idea that they had a reputation for quality and was trying to figure out why that was. But at the time, I don't think he realised at all they're just getting on with the job. Well, obviously in Houston's final couple of years, I mean, we kind of made the change from 8-bit to 16-bit. Um, what was your first... 16-bit machine then uh i think it was an amiga 
maybe he brought home the Atari ST at some point. Certainly, I remember playing Amiga games, and I have a very, very clear memory of playing Pinball Dreams um, on the Amiga at home uh, when that came through. Uh, that was 21st century by that point. Um, so, uh, yeah, it was probably uh, the Amiga. How did your dad kind of make the switch from 8-bit to 16-bit then? I imagine there was a lot more kind of resources needed for the, the 16-bit machines. Yeah, I think that was kind of when Houston was starting to... Um, Things were getting really difficult at Houston. It was really in this from from Iridium onwards. He was starting to get this unease, this sense of unease of, well, hang on a minute, this isn't really sustainable. Something's going, you know, coming going to come at us down the road here because development costs are rising all the time, piracy's rife, and there's no. He was starting to see, well, we can't kind of dig ourselves out of this financial hole that keeps getting deeper because every time you've got to spend more to to get a game and every you know for on a good game and every time um you don't make quite make as much back um so i think things were getting difficult and the, and certainly the transition to 16 bits didn't uh they weren't getting the original um the original games through so they they were doing a lot of conversions of some of the stuff they'd done on 8 bit and I don't think he knew at the time why they weren't getting original stuff through. Um, now, on, in hindsight, he talks about it might be because what he should have done is gone back and written another book, you know, hints and tips for the Amiga or something like that, to reestablish that, oh, these people have got expertise, get into the technical understanding of these new machines and be able to use that technical understanding and have that reputation for the technical understanding. But by that point, he says he'd um, he'd sort of psychologically moved on from being the person that dug down into the code and write, wrote books about it to being the person that, you know, markets and publishes and, and, and does that kind of thing. So I think they just lost lost their way a little bit and the development costs, they, they couldn't really see how this would work. So there were a lot of uh, conversions done to the 16-bit machines when it was Houston, I think. Was that a sad time for you then, being a young kid when your father's company went? Uh, yeah, I mean, I certainly remember the a year or two previously, we'd been on holiday uh, to Spain and we'd had the fantastic time, like the time of our lives at this villa that somebody, uh, a friend of the family owned in the village and, you know, had been kindly given us for a week or something. And me and my sister loved it and had the best time ever. And we'd planned to go back there. and But then I remember... Um, you know a few weeks before being told unfortunately we're not going to be going back there and um instead my mum took my sister and I on holiday to Brighton or South End or something like that um but dad couldn't come with us because he had too much work to do so I remember that being like oh okay that, you know that's a bit and you know because he had you know obviously stuff going on with the company that needed sorting out so I kind of remember that I guess so I guess I had a sense then that things weren't going too well and I remember going into Houston Consultants, the company, uh, on a on a weekend day when the receivers had come in and being explained, you know, what receivership was and that they were going to be closing up the company. And so, yeah, I do kind of remember that. And it was it was sad uh, at the time, but um, yeah, I guess that, that's that's life sometimes. So, um, how did twenty first century entertainment come about? He. After Dad had closed the company, you know, he felt a big sense of relief, but he didn't really know what he was going to do next. Uh, he didn't have a clue. Uh, and a couple of weeks later, he was at some kind of social event in the village. It's a very nice, close community in the village where my parents still live. Um, and uh, he was at a social event there, and a, a friend of his uh, called Eric came up and said, so, yeah, sorry to hear about what happened to you with your company. And he went, oh, well, thank you very much. And he said, how much money would it take to start this thing up again? And uh, apparently Dad, you know, put out a figure. And Eric said, well, it doesn't sound like too much money. And uh, from there, Eric and my grandparents and a couple of other people got together, got the money together, um, bought up the assets of uh, Houston Consultants and 
renamed or dad came up with the name 21st century entertainment and off they went and i think um he talks about how at houston dad had felt a bit like he didn't have anybody with any business experience to turn to and he'd really gotten into this thing by accident he wasn't a businessman he was a scientist originally he got into this by accident he didn't have any expert to turn to he didn't have anyone who had experience in business but with 21st century um he started it up with eric uh, and Eric, you know, had a lot of experience in business and, and dad says he, he learned a lot from him. And um, so I think that's really how that transition happened. Well, obviously, you know, some iconic games came out of 21st century. Let's, <coughs> you know, to this day, Pinball Dreams is probably my all time favorite pinball simulator. I've got it on my iPhone, actually. Um, do you remember the first time you saw that game? Yes, I do. So um, dad brought home an Amiga. Uh, he brought home Pinball Dreams and he brought home a challenge. Uh, he brought home the score, uh, which Barry Simpson, uh, the, the game's producer at 21st Century Entertainment, uh, he brought home the score that Barry had achieved on the steel wheel table. And my sister and I spent the entire weekend playing, trying to beat this score, which, I don't know, it was 60 million or 80 million or something like that. Um, and then late on the Sunday night, I managed to beat Barry's score, so we came screaming down into the living room, you know, punching the air and what have you. Um, and uh, and I don't remember whose idea it was, but somehow it ended up with me writing a note to Barry as a kind of, you know, 11 or 12 year old mocking Mr. Simpson, um, who's still in the games industry, mocking him for because I'd, I'd beaten his score by 10 million or 20 million or something. And uh, I don't know whether it was Dad's idea or if it was my idea, but anyway, Dad played along with it and took the note into Barry the next day uh, at work. And then uh, subsequently, about two weeks later or something, I was in Tesco, in Tesco's in the cereal aisle, um, shopping with my mum. And uh, Barry, you know, bumped, bumped into Barry and had a chat with my mum. And he went to walk off, put, pushed his trolley along, and then uh, went, oh, and turned around and said, Rob, uh, yeah, 124 million, mate, and then just walked <laughs> off. That's and he great. doubled he doubled my score or something. So uh, he I, he got his own back. Well, I I do remember in the nineties that pinball scene was kind of massive. These uh, <clears throat> pinball games and uh, yeah, twenty first century really owned that genre. I'd say. Yeah, absolutely. So that, I think that was one of the things that Dad specifically decided i think early on 21st century they'd reworked the houston back catalog um with you know um magazine mounted games they'd done a few other things but when pinball came along with pinball dreams um and when it was a huge success in fact the dad by this point he was so worn down by everything that happened everyone around him was saying this pinball dreams is brilliant it's brilliant it's going to be a hit but he kind of didn't want to let himself believe it he apparently because um, you, you, if it's because then you get just hugely disappointed if it's not. Um, but anyway, it went on and it was a huge hit, and and he started to develop this strategy in his head of owning a genre. Because one of the really tough things at Houston had been, yeah, they'd done some fantastic original games, but after a while, being original all the time, it's hard work. You know, reinventing the wheel all the time and coming up with new original stuff. It's hard work. It's expensive. It's very difficult to maintain. And so um, he, he had this idea of owning a genre. And um, and so he went back to the, the dice guys, Digital Illusions, uh, as they were known back then, and said, uh, you know, right, great, you've had a success. We, you know, we, we, we need to do a sequel. And they said, well, we want to rewrite, rewrite the, the, the game engine. Uh, so, and he said, no, don't bother with that. Just Just three new features to put on the back of the box. Let's get this sequel out quickly. And they went off to Seattle and uh, wrote Pinball, Pinball Fantasies. Um, and then that sort of laid the groundwork for, um, yeah, having that strategy of owning a genre, um, you know, and, and, uh, and that worked really well. So I remember like um, Pinball Fantasies and those illusions after that as well. And I remember like that on the Amiga, you could have like, it was like two yeah. balls, wasn't it? And you could see the full table at the same time as well, like in yes. interlace mode. So, I mean, the, yeah. the guys who were behind that digital illusions, I mean, did they come out the demo scene? Is that right on the Amiga? Yeah, so they were, they were uh, the Silence was their demo scene group. Um, and they were students at the time that they were working on Pinball Dreams. 
they really loved playing pinball games and they decided to make their own uh, pinball simulator. They thought they could do a better job. And it took them a few years and a couple of uh, attempts at coming over to ECTS in London, or I think it was ECTS. Uh, and apparently they had to kind of bargain with a security guard to let them in because they'd forgotten their tickets or didn't have tickets. And they come all the way from Sweden. But, um, yeah, they, uh, you know, showed the game to, to, to Dad and Barry and, uh, and uh, they, you know, they got it signed up. Well, uh, Silence had a massive reputation for kind of beautiful graphics yeah. and amazing sound on their demos. Absolutely. Um, one thing that was bought to Pinball Fantasies and all the other ones was really high-end, beautifully drawn boards. And they were also done in, you know, versions for the latest chipset. So there was the... AGA yes. versions and stuff. And I remember those were probably the first titles that I saw. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and the the CD32 had the, that chips, uh, was it the AGA chipset yeah. as well? And and they, they did all these fantastic multicolored uh, variants of the Pinball Fantasy tables and, and Pinball Fantasies came out on the Amiga CD32. In fact, Pinball Fantasies came out on just about everything. It was licensed to the SNES and... Uh, Pim- Pimble Dreams is on the Game Boy, I think. Um, the so, Jag- uh, Jaguar, I remember. I've got Jaguar. Plenty of them, yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I mean, obviously, 21st century, we're able to license it out all over the place. But Illusions was the last uh, game that DICE did because, obviously, they had uh, plans to go off and uh, do other things and very successfully, obviously, Battlefield and all the rest of it. Um, so that was their kind of swan song in terms of pinball games. They, they were, and that one, I think, is where they finally did sort of take their time because that was three years after Fantasies and rewrite some of the, the, the engine or the physics that they'd wanted to do and got all these features in. And really, that was their kind of farewell in terms of the pinball trilogy they'd done. But by this time, uh, Dad, with 21st Century, he bought a controlling stake in a, in a developer called Spidersoft, um, and they developed a lot of pinball games moving forwards, and and there are other people too that that twenty first centuries uh, published the pinball games from. Well, I remember Slam Tilt came out, and that was very late in the Amiga's life, like ninety six, yeah. I think that came out. I remember like you know the few remaining Amiga magazines going wild over it, but it was kind of yes. very very late, wasn't it? And Slam Tilt, who was the developer from that? Because I think they went on to do some stuff as well. I can't quite remember. Liquid Design. Yeah, that's right, Liquid Design, but who did they become? I can't remember. But yes, that came out. That, I think, is that you know was probably the last really, really great, great game that the 21st century uh, did. And that was arguably the best pinball title of the lot, at least as good as the Dice ones, um, if, if not better, because like you say, it came along a bit later and was very, very sophisticated. Also, I remember uh, there was a game called um, The Synergist, which is a point-and-click adventure, which was from the team that went on to do Skylanders, I believe. Oh, nice. um, but, uh, yeah, there's, there's an aside for you. Well, I've got to ask you then, what's your favourite pinball fantasies table? Um, Partyland. That's mine too. <laughs> yeah. have, have you seen these new pinball machines that you can get where it's a big LCD screen and it projects I the have old indeed. tables We've got- on? Yeah, we've got a Facebook group for 21st Century Entertainment and Houston. And on the Facebook group for 21st, uh, the, one of the guys who owns or, or builds these things is, is posted up a few uh, shots of Pinball Fantasies running on, on that, um, on one of those um, LCD pinball tables. Oh, and he's, so got a, he's, shot, he's got a video of one where it's got Kinect head tracking as well to give an illusion of 3D oh, wow. on it. So, yeah, there's some videos on the 21st Century Facebook page of, of exactly that. Well, um, we're big Amiga fans ourselves, and uh, one game that we really liked that 21st Century came out with was uh, Marvin's Marvelous Adventure. Could you uh, oh, yes. tell us more about that? Well, that one, uh, I mean, because obviously by this time I was, I would have been, what, 15, 14, 15 or something, and uh, I, I'd got, a, uh, you know, I had a Mega Drive, I had Sonic, and I remember going into train station in Oxford and picking up a magazine, and it's saying that Marvin's Marvelous, Marvelous Adventure was like the Sonic of the Amiga or the, the Mario of the Amiga or something like that. And thinking, bloody hell, <laughs> that's pretty good. Uh, I think, it, to be fair, that was one of the better reviews. And then they, they were a little bit mixed. But, uh, I mean, that was just a great game. Um, and I remember it was named by Stuart Gilray and Barry uh, because they were big fans of Bill and Ted's uh, excellent adventure. So, um 
uh, you know, this story about Marvin, the pizza boy who was delivering pizza to another dimension, became Marvin's marvellous adventure. <laughs> I never put the two and two together, but yeah, that's cool. <laughs> there you go. And I think Stuart Gilray, because he's a big guitar player, and he used to, he runs a uh, jaw now, Just Add Water, I'm still in contact with him, but he used to give me guitar lessons um, after school on a Wednesday or something like that. I used to go around to his house. And I cannot play guitar, so obviously it's, uh, you know, he, he can't have been that good a teacher. <laughs> no, I think it's more to do with me being a terrible student. But he's a big guitar player, and I think he did some of the, the music and the, the riffs in, the, in that game and, and what have you and had fun doing that. Well, with your own career, when you left school then, what direction did you take then, and how did you get into the, um, the industry probably? I did, I did my A-levels, and then I think I took a year out because I... Have, I hadn't really figured out what I was going to do. I always wanted to get into game design, but I, um, there were no game design courses back then at university, or there were maybe one or two, but they were not very well, you know, they didn't have a good reputation. So uh, in the end, I went, I came up here to Manchester, where I still live, 16 years ago, and did uh, started on a computing science course um, at UMIST, and uh, or which is part of University of Manchester now. Uh, so I graduated in 2003. By this time, Dad had sort of got out of the games industry and he was working with Rod Swift, who was also one of the early gaming um, people. You know, he did a lot of the flight simulators. Uh, he was working with Rod Swift and they had a, um, a web development company, so they'd moved into the web instead. So I did some work with them uh, in web development, um, I, I picked up some of the programming that I'd done at university, so, and then I got another job back up in Manchester in web development. So I spent two, two and a half years uh, in web development, writing travel websites and uh, what have you. And then an opportunity uh, to interview for a games position came up in Manchester uh, at Blade Interactive, and off I went. Must have always been in your DNA then, games, obviously. Yeah, I mean, I think um, certainly the, the, uh, it was always... I, I had a moment where I wanted to be a Formula One driver <laughs> and a moment where I wanted to be a, um, a chef, I believe. But uh, all the way through it, I, I always wanted to be uh, in, in games development. Um, and part of that's got to be uh, the, the background I grew up with. Well, uh, uh, I'm sorry, you also worked in a, a massive popular series, uh, the Lego series. I did, yes. That was uh, 2012 I went there. I, st I got into development in 2005, spent six years at Blade and Dark Energy on snooker and hydrophobia, and then went off to TT Games to do the Lego stuff, which was brilliant. It's kind of um, uh, like a, a piece of Britsoft or something, the kind of Lego story nowadays as well. Oh, it's, it's brilliant, and, and it's a fantastic company to work for. Um, they're based up here in Wilmslow and Nutsford, and um, yeah, I mean it's brilliant. Uh, I, I got to do six Lego games. Um, I'm looking at, over my shoulder at the little trophies, the Lego trophies you get for each one you do there. So I got I got I, I was uh, got to be game director on six of the handheld Lego games, and it's fantastic fun. Obviously, um, you have so much fun making those games, and it, it's a fantastic company. They treat everyone really well. Um, brilliant. No one probably saw this coming, but 25 years later. Houston Consultants came back. So that's right. What was the story there then? So we, um, while I was still at TT, we kind of tested the waters and we did a Kickstarter campaign for this book, which I've very cleverly plugged throughout the entire, <laughs> throughout the entire interview. Uh, no, I mean um, we did this uh, Kickstarter campaign for this book because I'd been banging on at Dad for ages about the retro gaming scene and showing him issues of Retro Gamer magazine or whatever, and he was just kind of like. He put this part of his life behind him. He thought it would just be vanity to, you know, think that there was any any point in revisiting any of it. It, it didn't, you know, he, he didn't really want to hear it. So it took me years of bullying him and talking to him about Kickstarter and showing him other retro gaming Kickstarters that had been successful, um, you know, starting with the sensible software book to convince him that it's worth a shot. So um, he said, all right, he grudgingly accepted. And we did this Kickstarter campaign. And it was massively successful. You know, we raised the money and we had this fantastic community. And uh, he went and did a talk at Play Expo 2013 and had all these people coming up to him. And he was really taken aback by the enthusiasm, the knowledge, the passion of the retro gaming community. 
um, and we wrote this book. So uh, we did that, and um, it took us quite a while to to get that that uh, out the door for various reasons that are explained in 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 the book. But uh, did that, and then um, this in January we were it was announced that we were Houston Consultants was. Uh, one of the winners of a grant from the UK Games Fund um, for a game uh, called Mechanist to, de- to develop a prototype for that. Uh, and then, you know, th- th- it, that came to me and the decision was, well, I can keep going with this brilliant career that I've got at TT Games, but um, will I, in, you know, 20 years' time, will I look back and ask myself, what did I, what if I'd taken the money and the grant and gone for it? And uh, so I, uh, here, we, here we are, I went for it. So the book's called Hints and Tips for Video Game Pioneers. Um, yeah. Obviously the title, you know, a nice continuation from the old books. What was kind of the writing process of doing the book then? Oh, wow. I mean, that was... As Dad started off started off quite quite well with it. Then he was he was starting to find it a struggle because he's, this is stuff that happened 30 years ago and he's forgotten a lot of it. Um, and it was also some really tough times um, that he was having to recall and he found that he didn't really much enjoy recalling you know some of the more difficult times and writing them and so it, it was a little bit of a muddle he he had gone to do an interview for um from bedrooms to billions and, and spent five hours being filmed for that and um the producers of that film very kindly i spoke to them on the phone they very kindly agreed to give me the the audio transcript of that interview and um i set about pressing play on the audio and then after sort of four seconds pausing and writing down the sentence that I'd heard. And I spent, you know, went through the entire five, five hours of audio doing that so that I had written into text what he had said. I tried a, a, a speech to text thing, but it didn't work. So I just wrote out everything he'd, he'd, he'd written in text. I then set about on the train on the way to, to TT every morning and every evening. I rewrote that transcription of the interview because obviously you know that was a when you speak you don't it's not the same as written language and and you have to make make that story uh, right in prose and and rework it so i started reworking that story uh, and passing the stuff on to dad um and then that i think helped him to kind of get the backbone of the story and of course he he'd then rewrite what i'd written again and say no no that i i'd never say it like that or that it didn't happen in quite that way and and then that that gave him uh, that allowed him to keep writing it. And then once he'd rewritten all the sections, I'd come back through and do some editing, and we just kept going through and through and through, and eventually we got there. Um, and there was a bit of a, I forgot to mention there was a bit of a pause early on because um, he suffered a minor heart attack in uh, 2014. Uh, you know, a few months after the Kickstarter ended, so that obviously. That obviously not uh, scheduled back by quite a long way, uh, yeah. as well as the difficulties that we were having with uh, getting it all down. So, um, but the Kickstarter backers were absolutely brilliant, and um, they were very patient. And uh, it, the book finally came out um, it, this year, earlier this year. And we bumped into you at Play Expo in Manchester last week, and it's not just a book that you're working on. You've also got a new game coming out. Hyper Sentinel that goes really back to roots. I mean, you know, we were looking at the demo at play and first thing Ravi and I both said is, you know, it's like a new version of Uridium. So uh, yes. <laughs> tell us about this game then and the, uh, yes. how so, this come about. Uh, Hyper Sentinel, it's been developed by uh, Jonathan Ports, who um, he is a programmer. He works in um, business uh, software and he's written this game in his spare time as a hobby. And we met him through the Manchester Indie Developers Group um, he took he brought it along to the kind of pub night that we have, and obviously somebody who knew about me uh, and uh, was a mutual connection, you know, showed showed us a video, and I said, "Great, well, I'll, I'd I'd love to see it." And we sat down and played it, and um, you know, some of the inspirations he had were obvious, and he talked to us about them, and he was a massive fan of Houston Games back in the day. In fact, Dragon Talk was his favourite game, and so we said, "Well, maybe there's something we can do here because." He's been developing it for iOS, but but we're saying, well, maybe we can help you bring it to. We're we're registered publishers for PlayStation and Xbox, and maybe we can you know work with you. And he and he jumped at the chance, and and we worked back and forth. And I wrote up a big sort of feedback document, and he took that on board, and we worked together to iterate through sort of improving it. And you know, Jonathan is he's, he's a 
he's absolutely brilliant because he's done all of the code he's done all of the artwork he's done all of the sound effect most 99 percent of the sound effects himself which is really quite rare to have somebody who can do all of that um and hyper sentinel is a fantastic action-packed fast-paced uh shoot em up it's got a lot of inspiration that you'll recognize as you said from old houston games and more than one source of inspiration actually there's the obvious sources um but um there's there's other things in there as well awesome power-ups big epic boss battles and um yeah it's, it's brilliant we're really enjoying it and people seem to be reacting to it and just you know absolutely loving it i call it one of these kind of uh retro modern games where it's you yes. know got the blocky old graphics but all these absolutely insane effects <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it would have never been able to do before and it's oh, really fast paced you know absolutely and jonathan port his his vision for it is exactly that it it, his idea was to make a game which is like how he remembers those games being back in the day. Not the reality, because sometimes, you know, you boot them up and in your head it was like, oh, and it was like this and it used to do that. And then you boot it up and it's like, oh, that's not quite how I remember yeah. it. <laughs> uh, so Jonathan wanted to make a game that tapped into what he remembers or what he imagined they were like or, or even... In your childhood, you know, you used to use your imagination to expand what these games were, perhaps what it was in your imagination or your memory. And I think that's exactly what he's captured with Hyper Sentinel. So are Houston back then? Is there going to be more games? Are you back for good? Oh, yeah. I mean, um, we're developing, obviously, still Mechanus, which um, uh, is, is, is going to be a fantastically unique game. We are doing some stuff with VR. Uh, in fact, I got a little bit of... Uh, uh, we were doing something today. We we're testing out a white box that we're working on, and I got a little bit. When I came back into reality, um, I'd been teleporting around so much that I was, <laughs> I, I was convinced I could teleport in the in reality. For a while. <laughs> uh, so we're doing that on the development side, and then we're also um, publishing. So Hyper Sentinel is the first game we're publishing, but there's several other games that we're looking at as well, which um, obviously we can't really speak about just yet, but they're looking really cool. So, yeah, we're back and we've got lots of stuff uh, in the pipeline. When can we expect Hyper Sentinel to be released then? So the plan is, because he'd written it uh, for iOS, um, we're doing the Unity conversion at the moment. Jonathan's working on that. We're hoping and we're aiming to have a kind of three-level PC demo um, in the new year. And then from there to, to launch on Steam, PS4, Xbox, iOS, Android, around Easter uh, next year. Can't wait to play that. Yeah, we'll definitely get copies. So yeah, day one download for me, that will be. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. Well, the iOS demo is available now from hypersentinel.com as well, but uh, yeah, hopefully the PC demo, uh, you know, in the new year. Excellent. Well, Rob, it's been amazing talking to you this week. Um, love getting all your stories. Thank you very and... much. Yeah, thank you very much. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you. Yeah, and it's great to have Houston back as well. Long may it continue. Brilliant. Thank you, guys. <laughs>